Well, amen. Good morning. Happy Easter. I said this in the first service, but it's true again today. I mean, the second service is, man, after that worship, it's like we could just go ahead and go home now. Uh, filled, rejoicing, overwhelmed, overflowing. Uh, just what a great time of, of worship together. Remembering the crucifixion as well as the resurrection. It's just been a great morning. But don't leave because I do have a few things I want to share with you this morning. Um, over the last month, we've been in the book of 2 Timothy. We've been looking at one word each, each week uh, to help us fan the flame, to help keep our passion and fire for Jesus Christ alive and burning brightly. We're not in 2 Timothy today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 28, but we're going to look at one word today, and that one word is resurrection. Now, you probably knew that was coming. I have thought about just passively, briefly, uh, some Easter not preaching on the resurrection and just see what the response would be. I'm not that brave or that crazy. Uh, besides, there's nothing better to talk about today than the resurrection. So we are talking about the resurrection this morning. Uh, a, a rising concern for many is the use of AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, along with that's another concern, and that's the creation of what's called deep fakes. A deep fake is an artificial image or video or series of videos uh, that says it's true, it's a claim to be true, it's attested to be true, but it's not true. It's a, it's a deep fake. Um, some experts are saying that AI will actually help detect deep fakes, but in reality, interestingly enough, AIs are actually helping create deep fakes. And because of all this technology, some things are, are kind of going weird. But what's impressive and scary at the same time is these fakes are getting really, really, really good. The technology is getting very good. Let me give you just a, a few examples. Um, typically, the, the, the targeted person is a celebrity or somebody famous or a politician. But here's a first example. This is kind of an old example, so the technology wasn't quite, quite as good. But you can see the before and the after. The before is the model who was being modeled for this, this AI image. Okay, so through the manipulation of all the, the technology, what you see is the after picture. So if you're the consumer out there in the world, you didn't see the before, you're just seeing the after, and it's the claiming, okay, that's a real picture, but it's not. It's simply a deep fake. The second example is a little more recent. It's a little bit better, but it's the same idea. You can see the original that they did all their stuff with, and then they produce the deep fake. It looks like Tom Cruise, but it's not really him. Now, y'all know Morgan Freeman, right? His unique voice, that unique look. Morgan Freeman came out with a, a, a video that sounded like him, looked like him. It was him, except when he's talking, he's saying, this is not Morgan Freeman. And it's, uh, it kind of created a stir, but it, it was an AI. It was this deep fake. It was this, this artificial manipulation, but when you saw him, you didn't see any of that. You just hear his voice, you see him, and you are convinced that is Morgan Freeman. But it's not Morgan Freeman. It's a deep fake. Now, because of this technology, even getting better and better, more and more people are asking the question, when they see an image, when they see a video, especially if it seems a little out of the ordinary, they're asking the question, is that real? Is that a real picture? Is that a real video? Is it real or is it fake? Is there some manipulation taking place? Well, there may be this morning some people asking the same question about the resurrection. Before we get into Matthew chapter 28, let me just state up front that the resurrection is real. It's not a deep fake. It's not artificial. When we read this, math, this story in Matthew 28, the story is not a fable. It's not a parable. It's not just a feel-good story. It's not fake news. It's not some manipulation of some actual events that took place back in the day. It's not the creation of someone's imagination. The resurrection is real. In fact, all competent scholars, but the first century all the way to today, every competent scholar agree on four aspects of Jesus. That he lived, he died on the cr cross, he was put in a tomb, and that tomb was empty. There's no debate. There's no conflict on those four facts. The only point of contention and debate is how and why the tomb is empty. Now, when you think about it, there's only four even 
possible explanations for the tomb being empty. One is that the women and the disciples went to the wrong tomb. <laughs> well, all you had to do was show them the right tomb. So that's a lame, that's a lame excuse. The second is that Jesus escaped. The problem with that is he was dead, and he was attested as dead. He was proven dead. The guards never would have taken him down off the cross if he were not dead. A soldier would never take someone off of the cross that they've been crucified on not being dead. But if for some reason he wasn't dead or he revived in his weakened, beaten state, he had to move that stone and conquer or overcome the guard. It could be anywhere from 16 soldiers to 60 soldiers. That didn't happen. That's a lame example. That's a lame excuse. The third is somebody stole the body. Could have been just some random dude. Could have been some militant group. Some think it might have been the disciples who did it. The problem with that is if there was some kind of group overtaking it, there would be some sign of war and battle taking place. Sixty soldiers aren't just going to give up their, their, their prisoner. The disciples, the ones that are most commonly referred to as taking the body, they they all, most of them died for their faith. They were executed saying that he has resurrected. They would not have proclaimed that had they known they actually stole the body. So that excuse is lame. The only plausible, really, when you think about it, the only plausible explanation for the empty tomb is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm saying all that simply to say the resurrection is not some kind of ancient AI thing. It's real. So knowing that, let's look at the passage now in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. We're talking about the word resurrection. The word resurrection actually is not in this passage, but the concept and the reality is very much in this passage. Every gospel writer uh, under the influence and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote an account of the resurrection. They wrote from their perspective, from their information, from how the, the Spirit revealed to them. So not every story says the same thing. The four accounts of the resurrection story are different, but that doesn't mean they conflict or that they don't agree or that one's wrong and one's right. They've just uh, relay different aspects of it. So it's actually when you bring all four of these accounts together that you get a complete and accurate account of the resurrection. The word resurrection is found in 12 of the New Testament books. It's, it's uh, found 40 times, the word 40 times in those books. But if you add the word rise, risen, raised, raised, there's over 150 accounts of the resurrection in the New Testament. I'm saying all that again to simply to say the resurrection is real. There's more documentation for the resurrection than you could even imagine. It's true. It's real. But even though it was real, even back in that day, first century, there was all these different kind of responses to the resurrection. People didn't know how to, <laughs> to react. That had never happened before. So they didn't know how to react to what they thought they were seeing. So we see some of these different reactions here in our Matthew 28 passage. Verse 11 says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders, and remember that, they shared everything that had happened. So when the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night. And stole him away while you were asleep. 
If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money, and they did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews, even to this very day. When you read through the gospel accounts, you see this this variety of responses to the resurrection or to the empty tomb. Let me say it that way. The guards, they knew what had happened. They were right there. They understood this something miraculous took place. But they end up taking a bribe to tell this crazy story instead of the truth because they wanted a payday instead of speaking what really happened. The Sanhedrin, these religious leaders, they knew what had happened because the guards had just told them exactly everything that had happened. So they knew something miraculous had taken place, but they would not respond to it appropriately either because they had been opposing Jesus for three years. They have been saying he was a fake and he was a fraud. This wasn't going to happen. They didn't want to lose their position and their power and their influence. So they make up this wild story to say something else happened other than he really was resurrected. Our Matthew passage doesn't say this about the women, but the the John passage says more that Mary Magdalene in particular, she was so emotionally traumatized. She was in such great emotional pain when she went and saw the tomb. Not, Not only had she seen Christ die, but when she saw the empty tomb, she had really no idea what was going on, and she was so distraught so much in trauma that when Jesus appeared to her, she didn't even know who he was. She couldn't see Jesus for who he was just because of of all this conflict going on in her mind and in her spirit. There were some, like Thomas, who had an intellectual problem with the resurrection. Without some type of empirical evidence, some hard facts, there's no way that he would ever believe that something like that could actually happen. He also had some people like the Sadducees, theologically, they just didn't believe in it. So their, their theology kept them from responding appropriately. Maybe this morning there are some here that you fit into one of those categories. You're having a really difficult time resolving the resurrection. You think in your heart and mind it's some sort of deep fake. It's some sort of artificial thing. There's, there's, there's some type of manipulation going on here. Maybe it's because you have an intellectual issue. You you just need some deep facts. And intellectual, you just can't wrap your brain around it. Maybe in life there's been a lot of trauma, a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, and you're having a hard time seeing through all of that to see the truth about the resurrection. Maybe your faith system just says there's no such thing as resurrection. My My heart and my prayer and my hope for you this morning is if that's you this morning, that you would resolve that issue this morning that you could know that you know that you know before you leave this place that the resurrection is real because it is real and it's powerful and it's amazing and it's life-changing. But my guess is that most of you are here because you do believe in the resurrection. That's why you're here. You're celebrating the resurrection. You want to rejoice in what the resurrection means and what it has done. So for you, let me share three accomplishments of the resurrection that we can rejoice in together. Because of the resurrection, at least these three things, the resurrection did a lot more than these three. But let's hone in on three this morning. Here's the first accomplishment. The resurrection solved our problem. It solved our problem. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 says, Because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. God raised us up with Christ. That's the reference to the resurrection. God raised us up with Christ. He raised Christ up and he has risen us up with Christ. But before that, he talks about this universal problem. It says we were dead in our transgressions. A universal problem for every one of us is that we are dead apart from Jesus Christ. John says our sin has condemned us already, and we are completely helpless to remedy that situation. Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. There's none righteous, no, not one. No one seeks after God. So we all have this same problem, this same issue. Ephesians 2 says we're dead in transgressions. That just means corpse. We're all a bunch of spiritual corpse apart from Jesus Christ. 
Now, we have been singing and celebrating not only the resurrection this morning, but also the crucifixion. And part of this story is that we know Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. He took our sin. He died for us. He died in our place. But without the resurrection, the problem hadn't been solved. Out of his great love, he may have died for us, but if he did not resurrect for us, then he did not conquer death. If Jesus did not and could not conquer death, then we will not and cannot conquer death either. So we might have a God who loves us. We may have one that loves us so much that he would die for us, but that would be it. We have a God who loves us, but he can't do anything about our situation, about our problem, about our eternity. All of that comes through the resurrection. Power over death was proven through the resurrection. So the great news this morning, the rejoicing this morning is not only do we have a God who loves us so much that he would die for us, but we have a God that's so powerful that he was resurrected for us. And so we serve not only a crucified Christ, but we serve a resurrected Christ. Christ. So we can shout just like 1 Corinthians 15 says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Because we've been resurrected. Number one, the problem solved. The resurrection solved our greatest problem. Second accomplishment, the resurrection sealed God's promises. In our passage in verse 6, we see that the angel is speaking to the women, and he tells them this, he's not here He is risen, just as he said. He's really doing two things right here. One, he's just stating some facts. He's stating the fact that he's risen. He's not here anymore. He has indeed risen. It's a fact. But number two, he's reminding them, Jesus told you he was going to do this. Jesus spent time saying, hey, in three, I'm going to die. In three days, I'm going to rise. He spent multiple opportunities to let them know that he was going to rise from the dead. So the angel simply reminding them, Jesus made a promise, and he has fulfilled that promise. And because of that, the resurrection now validates everything Jesus said. The resurrection validates every single promise that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. If he could fulfill The hardest promise there is to rise from the dead, which had never happened before, if he could fulfill that promise to rise from the dead, then that guarantees for us that he does and will and can fulfill every single promise that he has given us in Christ. So with that thought, let me just remind you of a few of the promises that we have in Christ. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am your ever-present help in time of trouble. My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in your weakness. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. He gives strength to the weary. No weapon forged against you will prevail. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again so that where I am, you can be also. Those are just a handful of God's promises. Scholars tell us that there's over eight thousand promises in scripture and the resurrection guarantees and validates and seals every one of those promises because of the resurrection you can rejoice this morning that whatever whatever promise God has given to you in his word he will complete it in your life he sealed every promise they're true and they're yours here's the third accomplishment The resurrection solidified hope. Solidified our hope. When you go through the the gospel accounts of even before the resurrection, um, when he's in the garden, when he is arrested, he has to go through the trial, the crucifixion, all that stuff that took place before the resurrection, you'll see that the disciples and the women were disillusioned. They were afraid, disappointed, worried, scared, confused, 
distraught. They spent three years with Jesus Christ, now seemingly all for naught, and they were utterly hopeless. But then you see those very same people after the resurrection, and they're filled with joy and peace and power and confidence. They're ready to turn the world upside down. Their hope has been restored. Their hope is alive. Their hope is eternal. So what we see here is when Jesus died, their hope died. But when Jesus was resurrected, their hope was resurrected. And so now they stand in this victorious, powerful sense of hope. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He starts this first letter. Peter starts this first letter by just declaring this praise, this exaltation. You can hear the excitement in his voice. Praise be to God the Father. Hallelujah. He's just shouting praise. Why? He continues in verse 3, In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's rejoicing because he knows now he has a living hope. And hope here simply means expectation. It's this confidently looking forward to the future. This hope is knowing what is coming is great and what is great is coming. Colossians 1 says that it's Christ. He is our hope. Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. And so we have this hope in us. That's why it's a living hope because it's the one who's living in us. Because it's a living hope, that means that it's active, it's powerful, it's dynamic, and it needs no external resources to be alive. Because our hope is living, because it's internal, it's not dependent upon any external resources or situations or circumstances. Hope can and will pervade your spirit regardless of any external circumstances, present problems, should not squelch your hope. Temporary setbacks should not squelch your hope because your hope is not dependent on external. It's dependent upon the internal. Our hope is Jesus Christ who lives in us. And so our hope is based on who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, what he's going to do, and nothing can put that out. So regardless of what's going on on the exterior, we know what's going on on the interior. So we have hope. It's a living hope hope. And Peter says, all of that hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is crucially important because it's the linchpin that demonstrates the power to give us new birth, thus giving us a living hope. So Peter's very right about rejoicing in the first of his book, declaring the the necessity and the centrality of of the resurrection because of what it's accomplished. When you look at these three accomplishments of the resurrection, you'll notice that they all work together. They all mesh together. We have a solidified hope because we know our problem has been solved and God's promises have been sealed. So this morning, we've been singing and speaking about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And they go together. They join together, and together they combine to give us the greatest miracle of all time. The crucifixion paid the price for sin and death. The resurrection proved his power over sin and death. Through his resurrection, we are saved. Through his his crucifixion, we are saved. Through his resurrection, we are raised. The crucifixion demonstrates God's great love, but the resurrection demonstrates God's great power. So we rejoice this morning as followers of Jesus Christ. We thank him for the crucifixion and we praise him for the resurrection. May that be your heart. May that be your spirit. And if you're here this morning and that's not your heart, I pray that it is resolved in your spirit before you leave this place. Let's pray together. If you still wonder if the resurrection is true, my heart is that the Spirit will minister to you in these moments and will convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt the truth and the reality of the resurrection. Those of you here that know it's true and you're rejoicing in it this morning, I pray 
But as we leave in a moment, that you leave rejoicing, knowing and understanding all that the resurrection means. Father, we love you. And we are here to celebrate the resurrection. To thank you, to praise you, to exalt you. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us to not only die for us, but your power to rise again. And Father, that's given us hope because we know that we're going to rise up with you one day. But Father, we pray now that as we continue to sing, we just want to remember you, our heart and our eyes want to be on you. We want to remember what you've done on the cross. We want to remember that empty tomb. When we look at you, we want to remember what you've done, both in the crucifixion, but also in the resurrection, that when we see you, we're seeing this, not only the crucified lamb, but we're seeing the King of kings and the Lord of lords raised into glory. So, Father, when we look at you, that's what we see. So, Father, we want to remember that this morning. So be with us as we remember you and sing to you in Jesus' name.